Hey, everybody, and welcome to Bible Study That Doesn't Suck. Sorry it's been a while. I got some stuff going on. Uh, oh, by the way, I'm Pastor Megan Rohr. I'm the pastor of Grace Lutheran in San Francisco, and... Hi there. I'm, my, my audio is jumping up and down, so I don't know how much is being heard. I'm Pastor Dan Sisdell. I am the pastor of St. Mark's Lutheran in Roswell, New Mexico. And our service is Sunday at 10, 15. And our web page and, uh, and uh, Facebook page is uh, St. Mark's Roswell. So check us out. we got lots of stuff going on. Yeah. And the texts for this Sunday are fun texts. They just don't necessarily go together. Um, there is the, the opening reading is from the book of Genesis. And it can be a fun text depending upon how you interpret it. Or it can be a grumpy text if that's how you interpret it too. Um, it is the story about how it is not good to be alone and thus god creates companions for adam which is a hebrew word that just simply means earth it's a gender neutral term because at this point adam contains the 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 human cells and the being of both male and female and this is the way the oratora the oral Torah rabbis interpreted this text was that, that this is a story of a human being being separated into two so that there is a, when you come back together in love, you are like a very romantic whole. Um, their understanding about how that division happened was more than just into male and female um, in, in, a, in a really stereotypical way that some people might think about um they believed that it was however god divided the two of you was how you came back together and so one person might be good at cooking another person might be good at shoveling and then together you make the perfect pair living in antarctica right and so it was less about um parts and gender identity and more about ways that you were compatible with each other. They imagined that the two beings could be split into two where one was female and one was also female and the one was male and the other was also male. It was more about this complementarity to each other and this sacred way that you get united through kind of God's mystical knowing. Um, and so that was kind of always a part of that explanation about how divisions happened, about how creation happens. And then if you think about it, the, the way human beings are designed, even if you imagine a straight world, right? The way that human beings are de designed in God's creation is to have a slice right here, to have a portion of yourself taken off, so even in best case scenario, if you're, you're like, men and women marry each other, Adam still had to have something female cut off of his body before Adam was declared male. And whatever it was that was cut off of Adam's body was female um, and became that man-woman marriage um, that people are super excited about. And so if you think about traditional surgeries of trans people when a trans person becomes a trans male they get a scar in the exact same location that adam had so if you wanted to you could call this the first sexual reassignment surgery in the history of the world and that very first sexual reassignment surgery just happened to be the very first human being so proto man is a trans man that's just one way you can look at it. Obviously, um, you got to find what works for your context, but I just want to open your eyes to the possibility that the full diversity of our current world existed in the full diversity of biblical creation. And so wouldn't it be cool if creationists who believe that God created the whole world, there's no evolution, had to believe that 
people who are not transgender evolved from people who are, right? If the very first human being's trans and God created them that way, anyone who's not trans, so, just saying. So ponder, ponder what it's like to be outside of the original. I love that, I mean, I, 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 I don't know if I'm being heard. My, uh, my, my um, internet's pretty bad. But I, I love the, um, I love that we don't take this literally um, because the, you know, the it says, oh, the man gave names to all the all the creatures of the earth, which I think is sort of, well, true, but also sort of funny in a way. But that you mentioned Adam is of the earth, and Eve means something too. I don't remember what Eve means, but they're both meant to be sort of representative of of coming out of the earth, sort of sort of thing. So I I. Um, kind of we are if we're all of the same being however it is then trans or whatever doesn't doesn't matter we're all of the same parts mm -hmm. so i don't know how much of that you heard spoken like someone who's not trans and thus had to evolve just kidding <laughs> i'm not kidding i think you are What's not that? i said that spoken like someone who's outside of god's intended creation let's read it metaphorically I'm just teasing you. Anyways. Uh, metaphorically. Yeah. <laughs> so I think I think there's an interesting um, kind of love that happens in this text. There's there's a beautiful way of, of retelling the human story. So imagine for a second also that this is a story where instead of human beings being vulnerable and incapable to take care of themselves, which is how they are birthed into the world when they are small children. This is a story about the created order of God seeing human beings as full of agency, able to name the communities around them, and able to like love each other. And so this is a very idealistic way of seeing the world work. Wouldn't it be awesome? If we were just molded out of clay and we looked like whatever perfection of body we wanted to have in our lives, and um, and that was something that was a part of how we could be in the world. What if you could just be born at age 40 with all the wisdom you had, but you never had to be vulnerable before that and you didn't have to go through puberty? Wouldn't that be cool, right? And and then imagine a God who yes, understands how cool it could be to be created without any of that vulnerability, choosing then to be born as a baby and go through puberty, right? And granted, we don't have a lot of those stories written down, although there's some pretty cool ones like the infancy gospel of Jesus that talk about all of the awkward things that happen. Um, but... I just think it's an, it's interesting to think about what human, like every generation I think has to come to terms with the imperfection of being a human. Once we know we're imperfect, are we gonna choose to just say, screw it all, let's just destroy the planet because we're imperfect and, and there's no ability to like achieve goodness in the world? Or are we gonna be people who seek to be good anyway, that we seek relationship and we seek companionship? If you're someone who's watching um, The Good Place, yeah. you might appreciate this text as because season three of The Good Place, which is just starting right now, is all about the idea that these people um, who are trying to figure out if can, can human beings live a better life or are we just humans who are destined to be terrible all of the time? This, this season of The Good Place, their theory is, is that human beings are better in community. That if you put people who are able to challenge you near you, if you love people in an intimate kind of way, that you will evolve within your own perception of yourself, that you can, that there are definitely people who make us be better or inspire us to be better. Um, I, they're sometimes referred to as like the saints of the past, like Martin Luther King Jr. taught us something, hopefully, that made humanity be inspired to be better. And so this is, this is one of those texts within scripture that leads to that kind of ethical argument, that in community we're better, God knew that, and so God created relationships and partnerships for us. 
The difficulty then becomes when you are in a relationship long enough, you are once again reminded about the imperfections of humanity and you kind of have to start over in those conversations. But hopefully you are able to develop friendships and partnerships and community life. The whole kind of purpose of church is to come together in community. Liturgy is work of the people, a group of people. And the idea is that the way that we have faith in God is made better because we're in community with each other. And then we go and we do, we do good things in the world, not because we have to, but because the world is better when we're participating in this beautiful creation of God. That's, that's this Genesis text at its best. And, and I'll talk more about what this Genesis text is like at its worst, particularly when it's paired to the Mark reading for this Sunday. Um, but first, I'm going to pause and let Dan talk. If Dan will talk. <laughs> I, no, I, I have, um, I've had people in my life who have said, well, you know, I, I mean, I, I feel like I'm, re I'm religious. I mean, I'm spiritual, but not religious. That phrase that people use or like, I don't need church because I've got nature. And I'm like, yeah, that's great. Like, that's fine. And I'm not just saying this because I'm biased because I'm a pastor, but, but there's something about the importance of community and living in community. I, I think this whole faith was meant to be done in, in community. So it, it, to me, it's not logical to, 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 can you be a Christian and be a hermit? Absolutely. But, but part of the benefit, the draw for me of, of the Christian faith is, is the caring for each other and learning how to care for for others outside of that community, and 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 that's so central for me that it doesn't compute being being you know by yourself um, in a in a religious sort of or spiritual kind of context. So I, I think there is a hint of that that in the Genesis, you know, that this is part of. It's not just about however relationships work but it's about working together for the betterment of of the earth of all of all people all creation so yeah i like that it doesn't fit with mark at all you're right <laughs> <laughs> well sort of does but only in a negative way i think uh the so some of the way the negative right. way that people utilize this text is one um people use this text to justify polluting the earth right Adam names all of creation. Adam has dominion over all of creation. And that means Adam can do whatever Adam wants with all of creation. They were created for human enjoyment. And so you should enjoy the planet and not worry about pesky dumb things like uh, sustainability because God wants us to enjoy ourselves and inhabit the earth. So, you know, shoot the animals as much as you want. It doesn't matter if they're endangered because they're there for you. Um, individually they're not given to a community they're given to Adam um, and and so particularly folk who are drawn towards thinking men are the boss men are the in charge of things that you can colonize other groups that you can decide who's more important that you can name and classify and rank things I mean it's it's ultimately this this text this idea do human beings, by naming something, own it or have power over it or get to rule over it? That, that you could, if you wanted to really simplify a lot of the major problems we've had throughout global history, it's been when we try to name other groups, have dominion over them, and use them only for the pleasure of individuals rather than thinking about the effects on a full community. Or you believe that people are, are more like animals than human beings. If you think about the ways that, that African-American people were classified in our Constitution of the United States, how, what percentage of a human being are other people? And those kinds of conversations are always unjust. And um, as people of faith, we need to repent and acknowledge that manifest destiny, this idea that we can go take the United States because God has gifted, to, gifted it to us, comes from faith principles. And so unless we are as committed to rejecting those, those ideas, uh, we are complicit in them. And so I think that's an important thing to name. The other thing that is... 
a weird connection. I'm not entirely sure if it was intended by the people who picked these lectionary texts together, like back in the 700s when they decided which texts should go together um, for the church readings. Pairing, pairing this text about God picking your perfect partner with a text about divorce um, can be, it could be empowering if we read it in the circumstance that Jesus meant. Jesus lived in a day and an age where if you got divorced, it meant you cut ties from females. Females weren't allowed to work, so they could choose to starve to death and die or to work in prostitution. Those were the options open to women during that time period. And not choosing, like starving to death and dying also meant you were going to experience a lot of sexual violation and possible other, other unconsensual acts being perpetrated on you and your family members. So Jesus is talking about divorce, saying that you can't disconnect yourself from the financial and communal responsibility of particular individuals just because you don't want to love them anymore which is very different than saying, stay in a relationship you're being abused in because God really wants you to stay married more than God wants you not to be abused. Jesus' intent in this text, given his context, given what he says next about children and people who are vulnerable, given what he just said right before this about if you take advantage of people who are vulnerable, it would be better if the millstone was put around your neck and you were thrown into the deepest ocean and you died. We know Jesus is not someone who is condoning taking advantage of people who are vulnerable. And so whatever way abuse happens, whether it's perpetrated by women or it's perpetrated by men, or even if it's mutual, the he, he hit me first offense doesn't fly well in the Roar household from a first grader. Um, and I don't suspect that it flies well from that ultimate creator who is our parent. And, and so these texts being tied together, if the idea is that the male, Adam, is given a partner that Adam can control because Adam has named it. If the marriage contract is seen to be a way of connecting property to a man, which is how it's historically been perceived in the world and, and what that institution has cre been created about. And then you, then you say that people should not get divorced, that people are stuck together with each other. It would be the equivalent morally of assuming that God doesn't want people freed from slavery because they should disconnect from people who are vulnerable to them. It would be more apt to say, God wants you to take care of the people you have made vulnerable by your systems of inequity, and that God wants you to seek justice. Um, and I know that Christian scriptures have also been used to justify slavery. They were preached to the slaves. Um, and they were preached to slave owners as a way of saying that God has an order to life. And what I want to be really clear to say is this idea that if you name it, you can own it. Is It's fucked up and it's a mistranslation. It's a misunderstanding of what biblical scripture is. And the reason, if you've ever heard the Bible called Good News, it comes from Jesus Jesus's idea that faith must be good news for all people, or it is not faith. Faith and spirituality and communal life that only benefits a particular segment of society is not the faith Jesus was talking about. Jesus is talking about a faith that takes care of everyone, particularly those who are the least, saying the last shall be first and the first shall be last. This is a faith that tips those patriarchies on its head, it tips the idea that you can name and claim things on its head by saying God names and claims you, you don't deserve it, and it doesn't matter whether a judge would agree with it. And it, particularly as the United States is wrestling with issues of should someone who has used their power and privilege to possibly um, affect the lives of a lot of women, and and women even so here's what i'll also say if if the allegations are untrue 
it is also a great moment for our history and for our society because people are gaining the courage to talk about inappropriate things that happened in their own lives. They're talking about what should and should not be appropriate at parties. And people are thinking about ways that they might have missed the mark to be able to repent inside of themselves or at least realize places that they have not treated other people in ways that they are beloved or that they are good news in this world. And hopefully this is turning the tide towards a way that we can truly live in harmony without needing to conquer people as a part of that process. I think this is opening up a conversation about addiction and recovery. It's opening up a conversation about um, making the world safer for women and, and others to be able to report issues like this. Um, and what kind of standards do we need to have in place for people who are going to be judges of society? I, I'm, I don't need to figure out who's right and who's wrong to know that the justice God seeks is for those who are vulnerable and who have the least amount of power to be lifted up and to know that they are loved by God. And um, so I just want to be able to talk about that a little bit because I think it's important in our culture to talk about it. Um, and uh, if you haven't had the opportunity, the ELCA is working on a gender justice statement. Statement is a, or a social message. The social message is something that takes a really, 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 really long time for the Lutheran Church to do because they write a long document and then they get feedback and then they put out a second draft and then they get feedback and then it goes to a churchwide assembly and maybe it gets passed or maybe it gets more feedback and then it does the same process again for another two years. That social message is a big public document. Um, but there's also, no, is, is it social statement or social message? I think it's a social statement. One of them is a really long process that gets a lot of feedback and then is passed at churchwide assembly. There's a second document that passed several years ago by the churchwide council. And it already says that our Lutheran church needs to survey the ways our church structure participates in injustice based on gender. And that means looking at the way bishop processes happen, looking at ways that pastors are educated, looking at ways that even the selection of pastors happen, the call process, looking at the ways that, that our institutions perpetuate this idea of gender injustice in the world. And so um, no community is perfect. Every single community has done terrible things that we all have to repent for. Um, but know that we ought to be always self-reflecting as a community, as an individual, as a congregation, as a synod, which is the fancy term for like geographical clusters of congregations and as a, a national Lutheran church and hopefully the, the church at large. And so the texts are a little bit, just when they're read, they can make you have a creepy feeling based on how you might have been treated. Like my parents were not treated well when they got divorced at church. Um, I know a pastor, the Lutheran pastor at the congregation where I was in high school had to resign the congregation because they were divorced. Um, and so we haven't always treated people I, I, well. I feel like... Um, I, I feel like th there is something here you sort of hinted at it that I that I really like about this text and that is when when the Pharisees are talking to, to Jesus about divorce they're quoting the the old law that 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 sort of hinted what you said early on about how it was the man who had all the all the rights all the rules and and uh, uh, you know well it was about whether the man could divorce his wife and there was nothing about the woman's rights and because a woman didn't have rights in that situation. And so part of Jesus' response is, is not just, 
I don't think it's meant to be quite as restrictive as people read it because, you know, it says, well, either one is, either one is committing adultery if they do that. But that was a revolutionary kind of a statement. Um, not just in Jesus' time, but even in a little later in the time of the gospel writers to say, if, if a woman, uh, let's say whoever, um, if she divorces her husband uh, and marries another, she commits adultery. It's not just that, that Jesus condemning divorce in that sense. And I don't, yeah, I mean, I've, I've seen similar situations where people have been, uh, you know, excommunicated from churches for getting divorced and stuff like that. I think there's a little hint in there that um, because Jesus, Jesus almost gives women um, uh, some, some power in that statement because it, when they're quoting the law, they don't, they don't quote, they don't give women any, um, any room in that, in that say any rights. And Jesus with that one statement says, well, women have rights too. Now, Jesus would prefer, I think, in this statement that people stay together in community. But I think there are examples at the place in the scripture where if there's abuse or if there's problems in the, he also doesn't say you shouldn't get divorced at all. It's, it's a sin, right, according to that. But it doesn't say it's condemned entirely. So I, I like the aspect that he sort of slides in, well, women have rights too. If that makes any sense. Yeah, got it under the wire. <laughs> Did you hear any of that, or was I just I cutting in and out? I heard it all. It was great. It was amazing. Oh, good. Best Bible study <laughs> ever. <laughs> <laughs> the, I about the, that. the Hebrews reading um, talks about kind of this, this kind of what I talked about a little earlier about Jesus choosing to be born in a vulnerable way to be born like humans, even though they're kind of lowly in the world um, and God being amazing and awesome. And, and it, it does sneak in there that idea that humans have everything underneath their, their feet, that everything is subjugated to human beings, that everything is, is, the use of human beings and i think it's a problematic idea um, so um yeah, just, i wanted to i yeah. wanted to jump in on that real quick yeah you had mentioned the 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 use of the word dominion mm -hmm. I, yeah it's funny that in the bible when the word dominion is used it's almost always in a in a positive way and and that is a little like that 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 does sort of give me issue. You know, you have dominion over the, the 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 birds of the air and the beasts of the field, and you have dominion over each other. And if you conquer them, you're going to have dominion over them. And then people that aren't aren't in part of your group, you're going to have dominion over them. Dominion is is control. And I I I know, like I I can't defend the Bible in this. It's because it's, it's bothersome, because dominion is used as a positive word almost everywhere. Because it's that, to me, it's, I've talked about this before here, it's that chosen people language, which I sometimes struggle with. Like, because it's not that we may or may not be, I mean, maybe we are the chosen people, but, but the problem is when someone else is considered the lesser. That's when the chosen people language gets, gets problematic. And when you read that that word dominion in creation story and in the historical stories about with Moses and and even in you hear about this dominion in in the letters of Paul, it starts to get a little to me it gets a little old. Like okay, dominion it should it should be rewritten as um, caretaking, but caretaking is not the same as dominion, mm -hmm. and so. I, I really struggle with that word because it's it's throughout the Bible and it is always put in a positive light. And I, I don't like the, the idea of control, like putting, like you said, under under your heel, under your foot, because it implies that whatever whatever you know that creation or other people are are less than. And I don't think I don't think that's what Jesus was about. And, right. and I don't know if Jesus ever used the word dominion. Um, but I have a feeling if he did, it was mistranslated. 
Yeah. Yeah. And, and some, one of the things that I'll do kind of in worship to kind of talk about this issue is, is there's this, there's a lot of kind of feudal language, this language about, you know, God being Lord or God being a king. Um, the kingdom of God is a thing um, that happens a lot kind of in the language of scripture, this idea of dominion, meaning that you're dominating things, this really hierarchical language that Sean or Shane Claiborne, um, he wrote a book called Jesus for President to try to like rethink about this language. It originally was for people who were conquered to think, think of themselves not as conquered people, but as people who were named and claimed and loved by God, right? And so whatever the equivalent of structure down power is within your context is the way to kind of think about this. If you have an unjust president, for example, I'm not saying you do, but if you did, then Jesus is your president, right? It's a survival guide for times when you can't trust the politicians around you, when you feel like you're being falsely accused or you're being mistreated, that you can have an escape from this world and you can understand yourself as beautiful and perfect and and if someone has to own you then make it God who owns you because God's going to take good care of you and God is going to be the person who has who who uses that kingship or that that dominion in a way that is beautiful right and Jesus talks about this later Jesus will say um, consider the birds of the air and the lilies in the field. If God takes care of them, if God feeds them, then how much more so will God love you? So this idea of you're, it's not humans are in charge of feeding the birds and humans are in charge of feeding the plants and making sure the sun happens and, and, and planting them, right? Jesus has the understanding that God as the, the creator, God as the parent, is responsible for caring for these animals, not in a way that is manipulating them or abusing them or only using them for, for satisfaction. And this is our example about how God loves us. So it would be more likely and easier to believe that Jesus wants us to care for animals and birds and not to have dominion over them because it used to be that you could slaughter whatever animals you wanted to and then Jesus went into the temple and turned over the tables and said there's no more like what would be a better PETA protest than Jesus saying kill me not these animals like no more animal sacrifices I'll just be the one to put my body in the line for this animal sacrifice and so it, it's an interesting like, that's the cool thing about the Bible, I think, is that you can find just as much to justify you as the person who agrees with the exact opposite of you. And I don't think it's because the Bible is conf intentionally confusing. I think it's because God truly wants to love everyone. And to be able to truly love everyone, you've got to be able to hold a lot of different beliefs in the world. Because there are a lot of people in this world that I'm going to disagree with to the ends of my breath, right? Right. And, and that's not how God operates. Human beings haven't figured out how to operate that way, but at our best, maybe we will, right? And I, I like this, this to think of it as, um, um, so I, I, I worked with the homeless and I had a, a garden for the homeless and my job was to make it possible for the homeless people to run the garden themselves, to do as much gardening as, as felt fun for them and to use it for their, to like as their backyard because they lived in these tiny little hovels that didn't have any sort of communal space. And it was so wonderful because people who had a hard time relating to other human beings, people who had paranoid schizophrenia or just were jerk faces, like honest jerk faces, could go in the garden for two hours and really feel like they legitimately had a loving relationship with a plant. And we ended up, like they killed a lot of plants, um, but we ended up planting a lot of peppermint. And it's terrible for the earth in one way, but amazing for the earth in another. It feels really great to water plants. 
there's something satisfying about feeling, particularly if you're someone who's always told you have nothing to contribute to society, to just go and spend an hour watering a giant garden. You feel like you accomplished something, you nurtured life in the world. And here's the thing, zero plants ever told that person they were a jerk. Zero plants diagnosed them with diseases they didn't wanna have. Zero plants, right? No matter how mean they were to the plants, like yeah. peppermint's just going to, you water it, it's going to grow everywhere. It does not care, right? And so there is something beautiful about <laughs> saying, if you, like notice that Adam starts with the birds and the plants and the trees before a human being shows up. And it reminds me of that, that AA kind of philosophy, like wait to get into a relationship right now and fix yourself. So if you can keep this plant alive for a year, then you can try to be in a relationship because it means you're healthy for other people. And um, so let's imagine this story from the beginning of Genesis like that. Your call from God is to be in relationship. You can't make it work with Eve. Fine. You've still got the deer and the antelope and the bears and they don't know English. They don't even care that you named them because they don't speak your language, right? You think you're in charge of them, but they don't understand <laughs> you, nor do they care, right? So there's no domestic dogs at this time. Adam's got nothing, but no one's going to call him a jerk because they don't speak the same language he just made up or God made up. Who knows who made it up, right? And so I think there's something beautiful that particularly right. for people on the autistic spectrum who find different ways to have community that isn't necessarily human eye contact language focused, that God gets that and finds connection and community for all people. Oh, it's the international text alert system. The presidential alert. Emergency alert. I'm putting it to... Which is a great the reminder. first ever national emergency alert. Right? Remember we said we were talking about like powers and principalities and people who can like rule over you and showing you who's really in charge. That's really good timing because you can't opt out. The president needed us to know Control. every single person could be reached on their cell phone by the president today. So God loves to that. I'm just saying, and may <laughs> your call from God and may your encounters with That's God. That's perfect timing, actually. Be that obvious. Dominion. That's my hope for all of you. May may God's love be palpable. May it be as annoying as that noise was. Um, and may you find comfort in your community. And if it's not people, in whatever that that online community or comic books or or trees and birds or whatever it is that makes you feel connected to this beautiful world, like enjoy it this week. So get good self-care everybody. And we'll see you next time. <laughs>